Oh, good afternoon and welcome to Roy Talks on Friday, January 22nd. Uh, we are so excited to have Tarun and Caitlin here to speak with us today about their work a little bit. Uh, we're going to be recording this and posting it on our YouTube channel uh, and other platforms. Uh, so we're interested today just to have a conversation and learn a little bit more about um, our emerging artist process. Their uh, work is in the gallery until February 6th, and our gallery hours are Wednesday through Sunday, 12 to 6 p.m., and by appointment. Um, so you can email me if you want to make an appointment, info at roygbivgallery.org. So with that said, uh, welcome, both of you. So good to see you in person. We've just been emailing back and forth, so that's wonderful. Uh, we are doing this across three time zones today. So it's 1 o'clock here, um, 1 11 actually. And Caitlin, for you, it is... 11. 11, right. yes. In the morning. <laughs> In the morning. And Tarun, you are 11 p.m. It's 11.40, yeah. 11.40. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> so thank you for being such a trooper and joining us in the middle of the night. We appreciate yeah. that very much. All good. <laughs> All for art. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, well then maybe uh, let's talk a little bit about the work that we have here at uh, Roy that both of you are sharing with us. Um, I can go first. That's fine. Uh, my name yeah, cool. is uh, Caitlin Joe Smith. I am an artist living and working in Tucson, Arizona. Um, but before I moved out here to pursue my MFA, I was living in Columbus. So I'm very familiar with that area. Um, I'm from rural Ohio. I grew up uh, an hour and a half northwest of Columbus. So that space is very special to me. It's an honor to be able to be at Roy uh, this month. Uh, but my work primarily uh, renders visible the intangible realities of unemployment and dealing specifically with the effects of unemployment on um, America's working class. And so I'm really interested in melding the lines between blue collar labor and the white walls of the gallery space um, and having conversations there. So right now at Roy, I have four pieces on display. Um, two video works, an installation, and some photographs. And I can delve more into those now, or Tarun can go ahead and introduce himself. So I'm not talking the whole time. I don't know how we want to do this. Um, so do you want me no, to? Cool, you, you, no, no, cool, you can take it forward. Okay. I'll join in between, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so the big video piece that I have on display in the gallery right now is called Lights Out, and I'm actually incredibly excited to be showing it. It's the first time it's been shown. It's actually um, part of my graduate thesis. So I graduated in 2020 from the University of Arizona here in Tucson, um, and because of COVID and the state of the world, we we didn't get to graduate, we didn't have our thesis show all of these things, and so this video piece I'd been sitting on um, for so long is now finally being able to be shown. But what this video piece is, is it is 60,000 faces that were generated by artificial intelligence. And so what they are and what the archive is, is I pulled 50,000 uh, profile pictures from Facebook of factory workers. So I spent literally months and months on Facebook scrolling through and uh, screenshotting and downloading profile pictures and then by creating a neural network um, and feeding those 50,000 people in the neural network, the computer started to learn what a factory worker looked like. And so it started to create its own. And what it isn't is like a collage. So a lot of people um, think that, oh, the computer just takes an eyeball from one person and someone else's tooth and an ear and sticks them together. But actually the machine is learning and it is getting smarter the more faces you feed it, the more realistic these people look. And so what you're left with is this large projection of these 60,000 factory workers um, that aren't real. And really what that represents is it's one person per factory that's been shuttered since 2000. And so it is giving a face, a fake face, not a real face to this idea of unemployment and this large um, issue that is kind of sweeping through middle America. And so that is that piece in a nutshell. Um, the other video piece I have on display is my work campaign from 2018. And it's probably my favorite thing I've ever made. Um, what it is, is it's a blend of John McCain and Barack Obama's acceptance, acceptance speeches from 2008 in conjunction with Levi's Jeans, their Go Forth campaign. And the reason I picked that year um, is because that's when the housing bubble crashed and that is when 
um, you, we started sliding into this great economic recession. And so one of the things that really interested me about this language and playing with language was that the language that advertising was using in this year was directly um, geared towards the working class man, the working white man was their, um, their gear, their focus, who they're selling to. And it's this huge multi-billion trillion dollar corporation. And the language they're using is the exact same language that Obama and McCain were using. And what I found was when I started splicing these sentences together, it gave you this long campaign speech that is very fluid. It reads like one person wrote it. It reads like um, it's the same author. And it's not like one chunks here and one chunks there. Every time you see a comma, I've switched who, where that source material is coming from. The background of that is uh, construction workers. So they were building new dorms on campus. So it's just a long take of the men um, that these ads were geared towards in the background um, while this text is flashing forward. And beside that, since uh, you're standing right there. Yeah, so there's a series of photographs in the show as well. Um, these photographs are taken over the course of three or four years and it's from a larger work titled Standard. Uh, basically, it's the documentation of the factory my father used to work at. And so in 2007, in direct correlation with um, the housing market crashing, my dad uh, lost his job. Uh, this factory shut down. So it's American standard. They make toilets. It pretty much um, employed most of the people in that tri-county area where I'm from. I'm from a very rural space. And so when this factory left, it really decimated the local economy. And we hadn't been back there. He hadn't been back there for 11 years at the point this project started. And I just really wanted to photograph this space. I wanted to be in this space. Um, and so one Christmas break, I went home and we went into the space. And it was very, it's very weird because half of it's been demolished, half of it's still standing and kind of in disrepair. And then another, I guess a third, another third of it is still a warehouse that other companies are renting out. And so it's this really kind of bizarre space to be in. Lots of rubble um, and just in disrepair. And it's one of those things where it's cheaper to leave it this way than to actually you know, spend the money to tear it down and create a green space or whatever this land would be. And so this, these photographs are the crux of kind of everything in this show, which the larger title of I'm calling Post Standard, but it was while we were there photographing my father and my mother and I, um, there was all these chunks of porcelain laying on the ground from all of these toilets that they didn't take out. They just sh shat, destroyed the building, they demol dem demolished the building. And so while I was there photographing, my dad was, we had buckets, was just collecting all of these porcelain pieces. Again, I didn't know what I was going to do with them. They sat in my mm. studio for like two years, but I just as objects, I love them. They remind me of bones. Um, they're porcelain, right? They're like this dirty white color. Yeah. I'm literally pulling them out of the ground like a graveyard. And so they sat in my studio for a while and you can see here the piece that they ended up becoming um, called In Mass. And I took each of these pieces and I 3D scanned them and I started 3D printing them. This is when 3D printing became a part of my process um, and they're exact replicas. So I made five exact replicas of each of them. And then the painstaking process of figuring out how do I display these? So figuring out how to make them this perfect square and how to make them this gridded thing. And I love it. I love the reference to bones in the body, but I also love the reference to like aerial photography, especially uh, photography of like farmland is a really big thing where I'm from. And so really the thing I'm interested here is how these shards of broken pieces of toilet, you couldn't be more trash or discarded object than a broken toilet. It has no function anymore by placing it in the gallery space. And then also starting to reproduce it, starting to use these capitalistic models of reproduction and mass production, mm. give value to this original thing that would have no value otherwise. And so of my work and what I'm doing, that's what you can see in Roy. Um, most of my work though, is dealing with these sorts of things and very rooted in um, the Rust Belt in middle America. Cool, so great. Thank you. I should start, yeah. <laughs> well, so my works are, um, I guess, autobiographical, like uh, I take time in, uh, like I, I see things in hindsight, how things were, 
like two months back, three months back, I write it down the very day that I am feeling something. So the recent work that I have done is about that phase of helplessness that I went through, and it was because of Delhi pollution. Like Delhi is the most polluted city in the world, and so it triggered kind of asthma or maybe bronchitis. And I used to uh, like take capsules, inhale capsules, and because of that, I was bedridden for a while. And earlier, I was doing something else, working on something, some other pro- projects, but then it got stopped in between. So after that phase. i i think my thinking process changed completely and when i was bedridden i was not able to even move a nerve so when when i when i went out after 3 months to like to my college i was in first year masters so i i started seeing things differently seeing people differently and also there's a railway bridge that i have to cross every time i am supposed to go to college or wherever because i have to catch a metro so earlier i used to just you know climb the bridge just in hurry and just go to uh, the metro but then because i felt breathless after you know climbing four five stairs or 10 stairs so i started to observing things when you know waiting there for a while on the bridge and seeing people around me so there were so many people i saw which were, which which didn't have home which which were often clothesless also so i i tried to kind of uh, felt a connection with them that everyone around me is kind of into some helpless phase so from from that day i started to documenting stuff about like i made some videos i talked to them how they ended up here and so i met this old uh, guy who was around 80 80 85 years old and he said he was there in delhi because of some medical condition and his money was uh, almost i think used and he was on uh, he he ended up on railway station he had no food he was and also he got some skin issues so he used to scratch his body all the time so i wanted to do something but i didn't know how to do it so i tried to you know just make a documentation of that whole process and and reached out to people like how can i help them so i started painting i started doing mezzotints on copper plates etc and also documented the people who were living around that area and so you know people suggested me that you can mon- you can do help with some monetary value or but i want to i don't want to like uh like help a person for just for a day or two days i wanted to bring about a change so i did my some research and found out a old age home which was few kilometers away from home so i told that guy that you can please come with me and i took him to uh, that old age home and he he is living a very better life there so i think the whole the whole art practice is also kind i'm like i'm using my art practice as a social tool now so right now i'm working on something related to trees or something related to air i mean the topics which should be the epicenter of our generation like right now i cannot waste that much of paper that earlier people were wasting right so i have to create some awareness about the time that i am living in i think for me contemporary art means you are evolving with the time mm. so right now i am like right now i'm working on some miniature portraits but after that my project will be around uh trees air and uh, and also there's a there's also one more project which will be i think about manual scavenging which is uh ideally ban on uh, ban on paper but i have seen people getting into uh these uh you know gutters and you know taking out shit with the whole whole hand and going there with bare hands so i want to i want to highlight some stuff i mean i show whatever i show in my works those are my visuals that i am 
kind of forcing on the viewer that it's my pov i want to make you realize what my pov is so if even if that makes you uncomfortable i think i have done my part so yeah i think that's all about kind of a gist of the work that i do and some works are in pipeline that i'll be i'll be sharing soon so yeah i think that's my whole practice that's interesting i think that um you know you you both have some similar themes of you know neglect and abandonment and decay and disrepair and um you know just leaving things behind. Uh, I think that's probably why the jurors put your work together. Um, and it's very powerful. And as you say, I mean, you know, universal themes, certainly. So I'm interested to hear what you're working on next. So that's exciting. Yeah, I think it's interesting too, to have the works together because all the themes are there, but to also be dealing um, with such separate spaces too, because I think that there are a lot of universal themes, but I think both of our work mm -hmm. is also dealing with very specific place. Um, and yeah. so to me, that's where the interest is that you can make work that is about such a specific region or place and it can still inform one another and it can still have these similar yeah. themes come through. And I think that's really powerful because I think that, you know, just goes on to larger ideas that people are people and we're all interconnected in some sort of way, even when we start to think that there are these huge differences and there are these huge divides yeah. and that's just really not yeah. true. I think, you know, when you, when you talked about unemployment also, it's a big issue here also. And it is quite rising the, the amount of uh, the percentage of unemployed people. And also it gives a rise to certain other things as well. Mm -hmm. Like when people become unemployed, the crime rate also increases. So it is kind of almost like similar in a way that I, we, we also have uh, like issue of unemployment right but you wanted to highlight it through your work but I wanted to highlight some other issues so I think I think the issues or the problems are almost similar in almost on the geographical you know way yeah and but I it's good that we were doing we're doing uh, the same I mean collaborative show it yeah, has a common thread yeah that's right I wonder how you know the arts particularly have a really wonderful way of bringing these themes forward, right? And um, in this time period, in this unprecedented pandemic, um, the arts are so important to us to connect us, to shine a light on issues. Uh, and so I, I think that your show is particularly very timely in that respect. It's interesting because some of the things that we're going through and some of the themes that we see in uh, just everyday life, of course, you all applied for this exhibition a year ago uh, and think about those themes moving forward and how you know the more things change, the more they stay the same. We still have these very basic issues that we need to address. So I'm appreciating very much that your art uh, brings those things forward. There've been some really great conversations in the gallery about those very themes. And when people see your work, they often remark, oh yes, I, you know, they share a similar story. They, they meet people who live on the street. They know people who've been in um, employment that has been taken away from them. So yeah, it's, it's really powerful. That's why I like, I, I say that my campaign video is my favorite piece. And it honestly is most of my work takes anywhere from like nine months to a year and a half to complete. And I made that work. I had the idea and it was done in 12 hours. It's the fastest thing I've ever made in my life. And it's also, my favorite and I say that because all of the text from that is pulled from 2008 which is 12, like 13 years ago isn't really that long but I feel like I don't know especially the past four years like every day or year that passed I'm like that's just more relevant and it's crazy that yeah something that is taken from this specific time for a reason those right. themes just repeat themselves and I think that's why that's my favorite work because as the years go on it just I think becomes more powerful yeah, it gives visitors pause, that's for sure. I think um, you see the video first and view it and then, wait, what am I viewing exactly? This seems familiar to me. We read the text and the statement that you wrote, then they go back to it. Oh, and then they just stand and you can just see them going, oh, and it, you know, it um, resonating with them. Um, most times when people come into the gallery, of course, they come here for that specifically, right? They want to be transformed by the arts, which is the most wonderful thing that the arts does for people. Um, but you can see them when they walk in the door just visibly 
breathe, right? They're in a creative space. They're in a space that's going to feed them, to nurture them. Um, and your work certainly does that, which is, again, just wonderful, I think. You know, I would like to ask Caitlin that, have you, have you been asked about why do you make stuff? Because a lot of my cousins and friends say, why don't you make unicorns and sunshine and landscape, beautiful landscape? <laughs> I told them I am I'm quite uh, intrigued by the uh, reality I see around. So when I'm done with the reality, when there there are unicorns in reality, I'll, I'm surely going to paint it. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I get that question a lot. And my I think my family has been, I'm very fortunate um, because my family yeah. has been incredibly supportive and they are the central theme, especially my father of my work. Mm. Um, but they have always been super helpful in like whatever I'm collecting or whatever like archives I'm mining or, you know, so they've always been really supportive, but I do get what you're saying. And I think the funny thing about me, I mean, you all don't know me that well, but I'm a very, like my whole house is decorated with like flowers. My favorite color is yellow. Like I am yeah. very, very optimistic person. I love bright things. Like nothing about my house looks like my art. And it's true. And I think that's because like all of that kind of you know, very critical thinking and not necessarily negative energy, but just like realistic yeah. worldview. That's where I get that out. Like that's my art and that's my release for that and trying to understand those aspects of the world. But that I feel like, you know, until you know me really well, I don't think that most people would look at my art and be like, oh, she made that. That's the person mm. that's making that. That's right. Yeah, it, it is interesting for me because uh, most times I know your work before I know you. Uh, and so it is interesting to to put those two things together, right? What you're presenting to the world through your art and what the conversations are like. Um, yeah. Like, people like right now, uh, I want to show you these capsules, if you can see. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it has some powder which goes into my lungs. Uh huh. Yeah. So I am working on some installation on the on the on the shelves that that remains after I consume. Like this is the device. You put something here, then you burst the capsule, then you inhale it. Then your lungs feel comfortable in breathing. Yeah. Else you you feel breathless. So uh -huh. because the air quality index here goes about four hundred to five hundred is our normal, which will be emergency in USA. Yeah, I, I don't know what we would have comparable to that here in the USA, LA probably, it has the most. And, uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm using these capsules that I took on my way last year, when my parents said, you, you, you should have these things with you, because you're you staying there for four, six months. Mm -hmm. I swear to God, I didn't even use one capsule, because the air quality there in New Jersey or New York, it's kind of like I have, I have I'm somewhere else. I was running in, you know, winters, which is incredibly unbelievable for me. Mm -hmm. So it's quite unrealistic here, living here. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, I, you know, yeah. during the pandemic, we were seeing images all across the world of, uh, because people were, you know, sheltered in place at home, um, what was happening to cities, right? Um, what was happening to the air pollution, how the earth was starting to heal itself, um, less pollution, obviously, but even nature starting to take over some spaces, animals being seen where they hadn't been seen before. Yeah. Um, really interesting. I, it's interesting to me that you're, um, well, there's several points that I'll circle back, but you're talking about now what you're working on next has to do with like consuming of this thing. And actually yeah. what I um, have started working on next, so I've been started 3D printing these communion wafers, which well, are- yeah, I saw it on, I think IG. Yeah, IG yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I yeah. have this whole thing of them right now, but I, I, I don't know, I'm gonna do some sort of huge installative piece, but it's interesting to hear you talk about like this idea of consumption and then yeah. to tie it back to what you said earlier about you know, the work in the show that I have in there is directly dealing with unemployment, but you're talking about the things that happen tangentially to that. Mm -hmm. And that's where my brain is now too. And so where I'm at is um, thinking a lot about like, like ritual and repetition. And I think a lot about the assembly line because m most of the people in my family are factory workers and I'm also from a Catholic family. And so I started thinking mm -hmm. about these ideas of repetition and um, you, kind of the vices we turn to when, yeah, we lose our sense of purpose in our employment or whatever. Yeah. And so where my brain is, is like religion and doing that. But I just thought it was so interesting that 
you're dealing with this this um yeah you know, thing that's helping you be healthier that you're consuming and then this is very much i mean just like this ritualistic thing but also something yeah. that people are consuming and i have no other really thoughts about that it's like it's brand new work it's just something that is very instinctual right now but I, it's interesting that that is kind of the path that both of our brains are heading down that is interesting uh i i love those conversations and those connections that uh you know come as a result of Roy, right? Um, you, you wouldn't normally have an opportunity to speak with each other, but now you do. Yeah. And, oh my gosh, that's what synergy that is. That's really incredible. Um, I, I did have a couple of questions people um, had asked that I wasn't able to answer in the gallery. So um, they wanted to know about your studio spaces and where it is that you create work. So maybe you could share a little bit about that. They wanted to know um, like what's your ideal thing that you always have to have in your studio and um, and aspirationally what would be your ideal studio space yeah um, I know I you a little on Instagram about your your creative space that you were lucky enough to have a studio until August I think yeah and it but I'm, I'm in like a very weird position where well a fortunate and weird because I, I graduated last May and we weren't given a thesis show and they but they promised they said you will have a show and we just and then they said you will have your studio until your show and we just found out we're going to install this June which means I got an entire extra year of having that studio and it's been kind of weird because of COVID like all of the stipulations and rules around it, but it's really nice to have that space. I also, where I'm sitting now, um, it's probably a disaster, but I have a home office. This is where my 3D printer is, and this is where I teach. Um, so it's nice to have my 3D printer here. But ideally for me, I, I need an outside of my, I need something outside of where I live. I Like you were saying earlier, but I think before we were recording that working from home was not, was very distracting for you. I'm the same way. The second I get home from work, I... Like it's like just full relaxation mode. I, I also work second shift. So I call, I get home at like 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And so um, I, I just, it's very hard for me to be in work mode while I'm here. So the 3D printer is nice because I can just set it to run and then, you know, it runs. But I definitely am going to need to figure out what I do once I <laughs> lose that space in August because that is a very um, important Thing for me to get out and actually have to leave the house at least one time during the day. Well, mentally, you know, to, to divest yourself of a space or to have something that's dedicated to creativity and something that doesn't have to be clean. In other words, you don't have to clean everything up at the end of the day in order to, to prepare a meal on that same surface or in that same space or eat a meal in that same space. So um, yeah, a dedicated space is really, really helpful. Karim, what about you? What do you, where do you uh, work? Um, of your process has to be yeah. in a space that's, you know. Yeah, I was, uh, I was uh, awarded a government scholarship where I, I was receiving a scholarship amount mm -hmm. and studio space. So right now the scholarship has been extended and I can use the space, but I don't go there regularly. Earlier till December, it was mandatory to go regularly, but now I'm working at home mm. because the work that I'm doing, I'm, I'm not using acid and I don't take prints at home, okay. right? Because the inks and the toxicity, I can't bear it. So like I showed you earlier, I'm working on some miniature portraits mm -hmm. and, and these prints were taken there in the studio, which is, I think, 20, 30 kilometers away from home. So oh. I prepare... Yeah, so I think the beauty of this process is uh, that you can prepare it at any place and you can work it out. Then if you want to take a proof, you can uh, hire a studio. So I think I have two, three studios here where I can go to print. Mm -hmm. Else, uh, right now I'm working on some woodcuts also. So the carving process is done in my room where I'm sitting right now. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, uh, the family also gets a little i mean they are they, they kind of feel uh they understand the sanctity of the place so this place remains quite untouched like you i don't i don't i clean it myself i don't let them allow you know anyone else to clean the space because the things are arranged or not arranged in the way that i know so <laughs> yes. yeah and what so do you they do? think yeah 
they think that it is kind of misplaced but at, it is actually on yep. the right place so <laughs> it's your own process your own method yeah, yeah. I'll share okay. I'll share the photographs and videos whenever the IG takeover is. Oh, good. Yeah, on that day. Yeah, cool. We'll look forward to that. Um, what do you do for feedback from uh, either colleagues or um, you know others who work in your medium or maybe not in your medium? How do you get mm -hmm. feedback about the work that you're creating? Do you want uh, to talk about the work you're creating? Yeah, I think uh, uh, when when I'm printing, there are a lot of senior artists here also. Mm -hmm. And once I'm done with the editions or whenever I'm done with printing or the final edition, I normally uh, take out some photographs and send it across to the people that I have met or I know from, like I have few friends in Poland, few friends in somewhere else, Russia. So I, I just send them the images of my work mm -hmm. and then I discuss it with them, like how the composition is or maybe, you know, I, I mean, they, they can't, they can't, I mean, it's not fair to uh, uh, point out on a, on a, on a skill level, but I mean, I can, I can talk about like how the process is, mm -hmm. but about uh, like, if I, if I want to place a portrait on the right side, that can be my choice, but they can, I mean, I take the feedback from people who, who are very well sound in their skill or compositions. Mm -hmm. Because whatever I want to say in the work, I think I believe that I learn it, you know, on my own pace. Because I don't want to, I don't want to say the things they want me to say. So it's it's a it's pretty balanced, or maybe you know, it's a it doesn't it's I have to find a middle ground there. Yeah, right. Yeah, because sometimes you know they are pitching for something, but it when you get carried away, it it doesn't feel like it's your work. Mm -hmm. So. I'm quite yeah. quite skeptical about taking feedbacks, but from but from you know, from people I I know that they can guide me through a process or some skills. Yeah, because it's I mean there's a line between them, uh, you know, encouraging you in what you're doing and maybe even challenging you to yeah. go to the next step or try something new, but still be true. Exactly, to yes. So you're right. You do have to balance those things. Caitlin, what about you? Do other people share some of that same studio space that you enjoy now? Yeah, I mean, the studio space now is weird because before where everyone's door was open all the time, it's like very strict that no one's in contact. But I, I'm very fortunate. I mean, I feel like coming out of grad school is a weird time anyway, because you're just around constant criticism and critique for like three straight years. Yeah. And then I keep asking myself, I'm like, is this a really hard part of my life because of the pandemic? Or is it because like I just exited school? Or is it everything? Um, but I am really fortunate because I came to Tucson uh, for art, for school, all of my friends out here are artists and they are people that like, you know, my family isn't out here. So I have like four really good friends and my partner who lives with me is also an artist in like my COVID bubble. So that's really nice that we can still talk about art. And I'll also like plug right now, I just um, am a part of this brand new uh, cooperation. It's the Rural Midwest Artist Cooperative. And I'm very, very excited about it. I actually think that we potentially will be showing um, in Columbus later this year, but it's this new group. Um, there's like 15 of us and all of us are from rural areas in the Midwest and we don't necessarily live there anymore. Um, but the thing we have in common is not only where we're from, but we're also making work about place, about this specific place. Yeah. And it's been, I, I think truly it has helped my mental space so much. We meet once a month. And again, we've only been meeting for like three months. It's very new, but just to have a group of people that I don't have to give the whole spiel, like, this is where I grew up. This is how many people I went to high school with. Like, this, you know, all of these sorts of like socioeconomic things that I'm dealing with to just be able to dive into the work and know that they understand where I'm coming from there has been incredibly helpful. Um, I think we have a couple of shows just around like the Midwest lined up for this year, which I'm really excited about. And um, we'll hopefully be posting more about on social media when things are finalized. But that truly has been my saving grace through all of this because yeah that lack of connection of like my committee and the kind of comfort of grad school and things has been very difficult yeah for sure i mean you need to find your tribe right people who speak your language who have your shared experiences in as much as we are a global society um, there is something about having a, a core group of people that get you that you don't have to as you say constantly explain or give reference 
uh, for the remarks that you're making. So. Yeah, and I don't mind doing that, obviously. Like, I, I really don't. And I understand that that context is important to my work. But it is nice every once in a while to just say something and have a group of people get it without any explanation at all. Yeah, exactly. That's funny. Um, so then we, we talked a little bit about that, what's next for you. Um, so that's something that you're going to be working on, finding a studio space. And also... Um, these exhibitions with this cooperative group. That's exciting. And uh, Tarun, what's next for you? Uh, right now, my works are selected for some binales and tenales. Mm -hmm. And I am working on a new body of work, which I'll be, which which I think, right now I'm, I'm in a process where I, I think I need to get a sabbatical because there's been a lot of going since January 2020. Uh, I got one scholarship, then another scholarship, then another exhibition, then another participation. So right now I just want to uh, like participate in, uh, participate with the works that I have already done, mm -hmm. but right now researching uh, on the work that I'll be doing because uh, I'm working on, you know, like uh, issues of manual scavenging. So these things, I think I need to learn because there's also casteism there. There's sure. also political issues there. So I need to be aware of the stuff that I'm going to be doing because obviously it is political. Yeah, it is. So I am kind of, uh, I don't have uh, uh, like exhibition lined up, but I'm, I surely have some, you know, selections in like, I, have, I just send the works to Indonesia. So I think the exhibition will be in March, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's a that's a group exhibition, right? So yeah, right now I'm just I'm just consumed in the work that I'm doing right now. That's good. What are you both doing to balance your lives? Because you can't be working all the time, and you can't be no, no, no. all the time yeah. without feeding yourselves also. So what are you doing to replenish yourselves? Oh, that is that is a really good question. I feel like that has been the struggle since. Um, mm -hmm since graduation, but is more so finding studio time. I'm teaching, I'm teaching adjunct at the university, which is what I wanna do. I wanna be teaching at a university full time. So I'm so grateful to been given that opportunity. Um, and I'm also nannying. So like, those are the things I'm doing, um, you know, during the day to support myself. And then um, obviously for me, I, I feel like since grad school, I have had so much less time to make that that is really the, the nourishment has been trying to, find that balance. And I think finally within the past month, I figured out, okay, these are my like Tuesdays and Thursdays now are my set studio days. I go and I teach and then I just spend all night in the studio. And that's what I look forward to, you know, all week is just to have those two studio nights. And so that's, that's been wonderful. I also live in the desert. And so it's like 75 degrees and sunny right now. So I know, but during the summer, when you guys are outside enjoying yourselves, I'm dying in the heat, but so I go, I go hiking a lot. Um, me and my partner like to go hiking and camping a lot. And so this time of year, that's where my weekends have been is just getting outside while it's this gorgeous weather and you can do it. Um, but that has been very, very good for my mental state, I think. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, Tarun and I were talking about that earlier. It's 31 degrees here today, right? And so we have, I have run club tonight. So I'm looking forward to just running uh, like three miles by myself with my earbuds in and just having a moment, right? It doesn't matter how many layers I have to, uh, <laughs> put on. I can't put my arms down, um, but it's still, yes, you, you need to do those things for yourself, whatever those things are. Tarun, what do you do for yourself? Uh, I'm quite enjoying my, you know, friends are getting married. So I get to travel, I get to travel to different cities for that. Nice. And Obviously, uh, going to exhibitions because because now everyone is, I think, allowing physical exhibitions. So that's a great part. Mm -hmm. And other than that, uh, I'm working out. I'm doing. I'm playing. I've started playing violin again, and uh, watching some web series, etc. So good. mostly, yeah. So I think uh, in evening, I think I go go for about two three hours outside, meet my friends. And then the whole day is, I think, you know, in that circle of reading, researching, doing some work, then going out, then you come back and you do some more research. So that's a, that's a whole thing for me. But I love going to different cities and get to travel because of the weddings of my friends. 
Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I know, you know, uh, it's hard to find time to create, but then as an artist, you're also a small business. So you also have to find time to market yourself. You also have to find time to, yeah. you know, balance your books and uh, send invoices and pay things and all of that. So, you know, all of that goes into um, art making, not just the creative side of it. Yeah. Uh, that's a, a conversation we have a lot with our emerging artists. You know, how how do they balance all those things and how do they get those skills? Because um, I don't know how much of that is taught in school. Um, a lot of it has to be figured out. It is a lot of, yeah, just kind of knowing artists that are a little bit older than you and asking the right questions. So that is something I... Um, I don't know, I had a student even yesterday comment on, I, we did artist talk presentations. And so they had like five to 10 minutes, which was always, it's always really fun because I love seeing what they make at the start of the semester and then where they're going from there. And she started out her presentation saying that she was in journalism. Well, she started out in journalism because she didn't think there was any money in the arts, which is totally just obviously something that you hear all the time, but isn't true. And then she's like, but I, you know, I missed photography so much. So I switched my major back. And that's was the point when I stopped her and I'm like, if any, anyone that tells you there's not money to be had in the arts just truly doesn't know how the art world works because it, it's different. It's not like any other um, business or job. It is very different. But if you're a creative person and if you are the kind of person that, yeah, can market yourself and loves that hustle and loves that lifestyle, it's absolutely um, attainable. But that is something that they don't really tell you when you're starting out that if you want to be successful in the That's world of art, you have to, it's a business. You have to be a good business person too. And yeah. yeah, I think that's a really hard thing for people to wrap their heads around. It's a hard thing for me to wrap my head around sometimes is how to do that successfully. Yeah, for sure. Cause it doesn't seem like it's very creative. It's a means to an end though. Um, but yeah, that is a part of it. Absolutely. But you know, in that case, I paint unicorns and landscape and sunshine when <laughs> yeah. they pay me money. When, when, I, when I get to do commission works, <laughs> I do make I do make unicorns if you if you're paying me some dollars. <laughs> so I, I do I do sometimes wall painting etc. You know to balance monetary stuff funds to work. So yeah. it's good to do it's good to do unicorn painting. That's uh, that's my suggestion for every artist. <laughs> Well, you have several different lines of work that you do, right? Some yeah. unicorns and landscapes, um, you know, these interviews that you have on the street, your copper pieces, the prints. I mean, so yes, a, a whole line of different products and uh, various levels. So that's awesome. Okay, well, good. Well, I, 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 did, I thought we'd maybe talk for about an hour or so. We're coming up on that time. Um, I'm so grateful for the share that we had today. Thank you so much for the conversation. It was good to connect with you and learn a little bit more about you and your art and your process. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you wanted to talk about today? No, um, I think that that no. is... Yeah. It for me, I mean, I keep saying, I don't know, I feel like 2021 is going to be a good year for my art practice. I keep telling people that. I feel like a lot of it is, I started out January with a show, which I think mentally was something that I really um, needed to happen. And I think just being able to do that. So, I mean, thank you for the opportunity to show there has really kind of put me in gear to be like, okay, I need to be getting back in the studio. I need to be applying to things. 2020 for me was just so much what the hell is going on that just trying to figure out like even what my place in the world was that I don't know I think I really got off track but with this show and the start of that group that I was telling you about I, I truly feel motivated to keep moving forward and I think that there there will be a lot of shows this year and a lot of work and just to get to talk to artists again is so wonderful I feel like all of last year you know not being able to go into art spaces or like see your group mm. of people and have that feedback um this has truly been amazing. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah. Last year felt like we were on quicksand, didn't it? Just when we got our balance, oh, it shifted. Yeah. Oh, no, we got to do this. So yeah, I'm glad to hear that. Good. Off on a good start for 2021. Yeah. Wonderful. It's a great start. Good. Well, again, such a pleasure to speak with you both. Thank you so much. And uh, as I mentioned Thank before, you so much. we recorded this, so we'll post it and we'll share. And uh Caitlin, are you going to do a little more uh, sharing maybe today on yeah, Instagram? Yeah, I was going to today. Um, and then after today, I'm done. You can uh, okay. take it over. Then Tarun is next. So we will look forward to that. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so
so much, both of you. Appreciate Thank the conversation. You. Thank you. Uh huh. Bye. Bye. Ta -da.